Let me formally welcome all of you. This program, Off Target, an in-depth look at target data investing, is one of a series of events we've been conducting to reach out to our Boston University alumni here in New York and through our webcasting around the world. We're doing this to music. Thank you. We respectfully request that all electronic devices be disarmed. Tonight we're joined by a panel of three finance and investment professionals, and please allow me to introduce them to you. Zvi Bodhi, to my immediate right, is the Norman and Adele Barron Professor of Management at Boston University. He holds a PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and has served on the fa finance faculty at both the Harvard Business School and, M and MIT's Sloan School of Management. He's now ours. <laughs> Professor Bodhi has published widely on pension finance and investment strategy in leading professional journals. His books include Foundations of Pension Finance, Pensions in the U.S. Economy, Issues in Pension Economics, and Financial, financial Aspects of the U.S. Pension System. His textbook called Investments is the market leader and is used in the certification programs of the Financial Planning Association and the Society of Actuaries. His textbook, Finance, is co-authored by Nobel Prize winning economist Robert C. Merton. His latest book is Worry-Free Investing, A Safe Approach to Achieving Your Lifetime Financial Goals. Professor Bodhi was recently named to the 100 Most Influential People in Finance list for 2007 by Treasury and Risk magazine. Tonight, he will share all his secrets with us, at least his investment secrets. Professor William Samuelson will join us in progress. He's a professor of finance and economics at Boston University as well. He earned his PhD in economics from Harvard University. He, you're staring. He's the empty chair at the moment. In the, wor in he, the words... He's transparent. <laughs> in the words Samuelson and economics, there seems to be a familiar ring. That's because Bill was sired by Paul Samuelson, whose economics text textbook is the backbone of college-level economics and has been for half a decade. So he's an outstanding economics professor, both by training and by genealogy. Professor Bill Samuelson's research interests include decision-making, microeconomics, game theory, experimental economics, bargaining, and competitive bidding. He's written numerous articles from scholarly journals such as the American Economic Review, Econometrica, Journal of Finance, Journal of Risk and Uncertainty, Management Science, and Operations Research. He's co-author of two books, Game Theory and Business Applications is one of them, and Managerial Economics, and now in its fifth edition, is the second. He was awarded the John Russell Award for Teaching Excellence by the Executive MBA students in 1999. And finally, Jason Zweig. He is here. <laughs> Jason is a senior writer at Money Magazine, and there are copies of Money in your tables. He is also the editor of the revised edition of Benjamin Graham's The Intelligent Investor. Jason is recognized as one of the country's leading experts on mutual funds and is also cited for his views on the psychology of investing and the history of the stock market. His monthly column, The Intelligent Investor, takes aim at investing myths, misconceptions, and conventional wisdom, offering analysis and advice with a wary eye. Mr. Zweig is a frequent public speaker and has made numerous television and radio appearances, including on NBC, ABC's Nightline with Ted Koppel, on CNN, on CNBC, on MSNBC, National Public Radio, and the PBS shows The News Hour with Jim Lehrer and Nightly Business Report, and that money show. He's an equal opportunity appearer. In addition, he's a director of the Museum of American Finance in New York, which is an affiliate of the Smithsonian Institution. He's also an associate editor of the Quarterly Journal of Behavioral Finance. Mr. Zweig's new book on the neuroscience of money will be published by Simon & Schuster in September of this year. We welcome all of our panelists, including our virtual panelist who will be here momentarily thanks to uh, the American Airlines system. <laughs> the topics the panel will address this evening, and these are just some of them because this is going to be a dialogue between you and they, so the topics will be whatever you choose them to be. 
But the general topics are target date funds and defined contribution plans and suggestions for lower risk investment approaches. The need for tips, not stock tips, but treasury, treasury and inflation protected securities. And the need for insurance in defined contribution plans. And finally, the quality of education available to plan participants today and suggestions that participants require more information about potential investment risks than we presently have. <clears throat> A word on the logistics of this panel discussion. This event is being webcast live. Guests are invited to participate. In fact, you're required to participate by asking questions. But please speak into the microphone. We'll have two women with microphones uh, in the audience. And that way, everybody here will hear you, and everyone at the webcast uh, end of this performance will hear you. <clears throat> Please remember, as I asked earlier, to turn off all your cell phones and electronic devices. Thank you very much. Perhaps I'll begin with an opening question, and that will stimulate some on your part, I think. Most of us were educated and in our adult lives came to believe that equities outperformed fixed income instruments pretty dramatically over any extended period of time. And yet some of these scholars sitting before us think that equities may not be a very good idea for retirement accounts. I thought I'd begin by asking them to please explain themselves. Mr. Professor Bodhi. Be happy to start, Lou. Uh, I know the conventional wisdom uh, that is preached at all the websites and investor education pamphlets uh, is equities for the long run. Uh, if you want growth, if you want inflation protection, uh, you ought to keep a substantial amount of your retirement money in equities. Uh, however, what is not emphasized in that literature is that equities are risky. And they're risky no matter how long your time horizon is. And in fact, sometimes uh, when I read those so-called educational materials, uh, I get the feeling that I'm being told it's a sure thing in the long run. Anything but. And that's especially so when you are investing with a particular target date in mind because there's nothing that says that your equity portfolio is going to be worth a specific amount of money or at least a specific amount of money, William has arrived, uh, at a specific target date. So my view of what's wrong with the target date funds which have now become so popular as a, as a uh, solution for people who don't know how to invest their money in their uh, retirement account is that as people approach retirement, they ought to be put into something very safe. In other words, something that guarantees them an inflation-protected income level in retirement. That's entirely feasible. Today. As they approach retirement. Yes, so, as they approach. So how about the 35-year-olds in the audience? Well, 35-year-olds, it's a different story. They're the major consideration that comes out of the, you know, both common sense and the uh, economics uh, literature, is it all depends how risky your major asset is. Your major asset is your earning power. When you're 35, it's for the vast majority of Americans, the largest single asset you have is your human capital. If your human capital is safe, like if you're a tenured professor at a major <laughs> university with a boss who gives raises every now and then, uh, then, then clearly in the rest of your portfolio, you can, you can take some risk. You might even want to be 100% in equities. But if you're like my son-in-law and you're an investment analyst who earns your money, who earns his living from the markets, his human capital is like a stock. He's already invested in the stock market. So, so I keep telling, and he's 35, I keep telling him I hope that your retirement portfolio is invested in inflation protected bonds. 
I hope for you, for my daughter's sake, for my granddaughter's sake. Uh, and of course, he ignores me, <laughs> but there's nothing new there. Yeah. Welcome, Bill. I'm glad the, to be here. Better the, than sitting on the tarmac at JFK. You, <laughs> you have been introduced. Great. And we're delighted that you're here safely. Uh, the question that Z was responding to was my opening question before we take questions from the audience, and that was given the conventional wisdom of the, uh, the performance of equities over bonds over the long pull, why would we be so uh, concerned about that in the writings we read from all of you on retirement savings and the fact that equities are too risky? So Z yeah. just gave us his response to that. Would you care to respond? Uh, yeah, my question, I, I usually agree with Z some of the time. Um, <laughs> I'll take a behaviorist approach. I think people don't do enough an analysis and thinking about it. So the first thing I'd say about life cycle funds, target funds, is you have to be in the game. Um, most people, uh, if you look at it, uh, don't even invest in 401ks unless they're made to. Uh, it's the default option these days. Uh, so I do a lot of research on status quo bias, and the status quo bias is oftentimes to do nothing, uh, to have a slightly more expensive apartment when you're 35, and have discretionary income to spend and not actively save it. Uh, then the question of when you do save it, how do you allocate it? Uh, again, <laughs> there's a lot of inertia. Um, if your 401k option is invest 3% as the default, people invest 3% uh, or invest zero. Um, and uh, if in, instead it was raised to 9%, the employer was giving you a default of 9%, uh, you get savings. 8%, 9%, 12% sometimes. Um, so uh, there's been surveys about how much people want to save. And the answer comes back, oftentimes I want to save 15%. Are they saving adequately? They answer this next question. Two thirds say no. Uh, of the people who say no and intend to save more, how many actually do it? About 15% of those people actually raise their contributions. Um, so I'm for a little paternalism, uh, give people help and keep it simple and make the defaults such that you save more. And then my other default, I agree with Savita to some degree, um, I like uh, target life cycle funds because it makes it easier. I would like to have it fine tuned to how much risk you're willing to take, uh, your age obviously it's tuned to. And another variable which is important is uh, how much risk you can take on is not just your human capital, which I agree upon, we wrote a paper about it, but also if you've got a big asset by the time you retire, like a house, it's an issue of how you treat that asset. Uh, is it part of your financial wealth, which allows you to take on some more risk, or is it simply a consumption asset, which you're not going to use as a financial asset? That's an important, I think, decision. You mentioned that young people would typically prefer a better apartment, a little more discretionary money. That's a stereotype. I'm, uh, that's no, the, I, and I'm not disagreeing, but I'm thinking that that's in the human condition. When you're 35, you're immortal. When you're 60, right. you realize that the end is closer than the past. Right. But I'm wondering uh, if it's part of the human condition, what can we do to educate the 35-year-olds, just use that expression, uh, to be more serious about the life after work? Right. One thing which BU does, which I'm a big fan of, is in the discretionary uh, retirement contribution, you always have the option to do the max. So if I'm trying to optimize as an academic, I'm willing to do it as, like, as much as the next guy is, but I can't figure it out. It's a lot easier for me to say, look, I'm going to max out my discretionary retirement space, baby, and, and, and keep that money out of my hands. And I have to look up each year what the max is. It's a mm -hmm. formula. And I'd rather not even know it. I'd rather simply be confident that I'm actually putting away in a kind of a hands-off sort of way uh, the, the most I can do. And then yeah. if I reassess that when I hit age 54 and I have more than I need, then I'll go from that corner solution to something a lot more moderate. And particularly if my house is, has increased in value spectacularly and things like that. Um, if my kids have actually got jobs and have flown the coop and I don't have to worry about them. So there's lots of contingency planning you can do, but I think keeping it simple and saying a default which says I'm going to do the max or my due 10% is where the, where the place to go is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jason? Well, I completely agree um, both with Svi and with Bill. I think that um, there are two basic problems. One is that the propaganda 
about stocks for the long run is based on bad thinking and also on, fault, on faulty data. Um, and the other key problem is that human behavior is an obstacle to human success when, when we invest. The reason, the whole reason investing is endlessly interesting is because it brings out human nature at its best sometimes, and primarily at its worst. And um, when you combine both of those factors, you have a really difficult problem. And I think the financial industry, partly because of the way federal law is set up and the way regulations are designed in this country, has done a pretty poor job of helping people with these challenges. You know, one of the things that have emerged from the neuroeconomics research that I discuss in my book is that there are actually two systems in the human brain. And so if you think about um, saving money for uh, a goal a few days from now, that's likely to be very uh, emotionally rich to you. Or maybe put it, put it in a way that's more appealing. If you think about getting money tomorrow, that's exciting. If you think about getting money 10 years from now, it's nothing. It's not even unexciting. It's just nothing. It, there's no feeling. And in fact, if you scan the brains of people who are presented with choices like this, would you rather have $11 a week from now or $10 six days from now, people will almost always pick the $10. If you move that choice farther out in time and you say, a year from now, would you rather have $11? Or 364 days from now, would you rather have 10? Then people are willing to wait for the extra dollar because it doesn't seem to matter. They say, well, it's another dollar. Why don't I wait for it? And in fact, those decisions are processed by two different systems in the brain. The short-term decision is processed by emotional circuits that are fundamental to how we that make decisions about risk and reward. And the long-term decision is processed in the more thoughtful, so-called rational part of the brain. And retirement planning is entirely designed to appeal to the rational long-term brain, which generates very little emotion. So one thing that would work is if instead of talking about retirement, we talked instead about May 23rd, 2034, and we showed people the photograph of the villa in Tuscany that they'll be retiring to, or the beach in Mexico that they will retire on, and then said to them, you can do this with 1.1 million dollars in today's money, um, then they would get excited and then they would be motivated. But the problem is under current law that's very difficult to do without getting into a lot of problems. Better yet warn them about the dire straits they're going to be in if they don't right. save. I think the real estate agents in Tuscany would love that program. Yes, they would. Uh, if we are all mere mortals and we get excited about eight and a half percent returns over the long term versus four percent and therefore we make the mistake of getting into equities too soon. Isn't that going to be exacerbated by the all the excitement about hedge funds and equity funds which are returning 20 and 25 percent? Don't I want to be in that? Yeah, here's here's the problem as I see it without getting into the neurological structure of the brain. Most people don't know enough about investing to make rational investment decisions, even if they wanted to be rational. So let's put that aside mm -hmm. for a second and, and ask the question, take any subject where we as consumers have to make important decisions that affect our lives. Medicine, for example, healthcare. We're presented with choices. I recently had this myself to have spinal surgery, which is a somewhat risky procedure, 
but offers the promise of a complete cure to the problem I had. So I consider that high risk, high, high reward. reward, versus a much less risky procedure, but I'm constantly going to have pain and, or from time to time, some amount of pain. <laughs> and you know how I decided that issue? I said, Doc, what would you do if you were me? Right. <laughs> is he a tenured professor? And he is actually uh, a Harvard professor. Mm. Right. We, won't hold, we, we, we won't hold that against him. <laughs> Have you read how doctors think? But, yeah. but he's trying. Yeah, they're a little so you worried. Have the same question if yeah. it was a BU professor? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have even been asked. I would have so, said, go ahead, doc. So, so what did he... Uh, All right, so, so here's my point. Well, you want a resolution to the question, but I did have the surgery. But the point is that we are now in a position where we have to man make decisions we're not qualified to make. Uh, I think we need to get back to a situation where the default options in the pension plans that we have or the individual retirement accounts that we have are established by acknowledged experts who do not have a conflict of interest, okay, who are making the best decisions from the consumer point of view or at least are making decisions that are presented to consumers so that they can make informed, intelligent choices. And that is not happening today in 401k, IRA type plans. And just to make the point, for the vast majority of us, our choices today in all these retirement plans is from a set of mutual funds. Okay? Mutual funds don't have maturity dates. Their value fluctuates from day to day. So there is no way in the world, just using mutual funds, that you can promise anybody any amount of money or any standard of living at any date in the future. So why are we calling these mutual fund plans target date retirement funds? Mm -hmm. They don't have maturity dates. It's a misleading name. And this gets back to the issue of regulation. You know what you're going to get when you reach your target date? Whatever's in the fund. Right. And the small print says that, so the mutual fund industry can say, hey, look, we're not misleading anybody. But the fact of the matter is that if you put money into a target date fund that's, let's say, uh, maturing 2030. With most of the fund families, that means that between now and then, they're going to start with a pretty, very high percentage in equity funds. And by the time you reach the target date, the proportion in equities is going to be about 40 to 50 percent. Let's say that's when you're age 65. Do you know how volatile the value of a portfolio that's 50% invested in equities is very, very volatile. There's no minimum guarantee. So for starters, were I the president or were I you know, making a platform for the next president, uh, candidate for the presidency, I'd say, look, you don't have to compel anybody to do anything. But suppose you had, as the default option, in all of these target date funds, a minimum guaranteed amount that you would get. And it has to be specified on the contract. Now, we investment professionals, and there are many in this room tonight, all know how you guarantee a certain amount at a specific date. It's called fixed income instruments, mm -hmm. okay? Not mutual funds. With or without inflation protection. I'd be in favor of with inflation protection. So you have tips in that portfolio, treasury inflation protected securities. And you have enough of them so that at the target date, you can exactly precisely guarantee a minimum value. That, to my mind, is what ought to be done in these funds. So in that example, you could guarantee, I'll make up a number, a 4% return 
by 2030. Alternatively, you can get into a non-guaranteed one and you might make eight or 10 percent or you might lose. Exactly. You give me the choice? Exactly. Now, the question, see, the, the problem is in a lot of these 401k plans, largely as a result of, you know, in response to our understanding mm -hmm. how people make decisions or don't make decisions, people are going to wind up in some default. And I think the default ought to be something that guarantees them an inflation-protected return, not one of these target date retirement mm -hmm. funds. I suppose if the fund manager was optimistic, he or she could guarantee 4.5% with a max of 6. And if as a fund manager I could outperform that, I keep the 2 or the 3. Well, you see, here's where you'd rely on competition, right? Mm -hmm. But the competition would have, as a common element, some guaranteed floor. Right. Please, uh, wait for the microphone, please. Microphone. We have several questions in the front here, but so that the web uh, viewers could hear them, you'll need to speak into the microphone. Thank you. Um, you've mentioned several times Treasury inflation protected securities. Now, from what I understand, those are backed by uh, government debt, U.S. government debt to a certain extent. What if I don't have faith that in 30 or 40 years' time the American government's ability to deliver on its debt is what it is today? What instrument might you recommend if I was investing today to try to mitigate that risk? Well, I agree, but let's also, well, well, no, well, let's also assume that the American economy has less of an impact on the overall world economy in 30 or 40 years' time as well. Uh, is there something available today that you'd say would be comparable that has perhaps more of an international exposure? Well, sure. It, it'd just be a diversified, an internationally diversified portfolio of inflation-protected right. securities. Interestingly, you know, it, uh, during the last 10 years, virtually every major government in the world has issued inflation-protected yep. debt. Now, these are different inflation rates, right? So you could diversify across national governments. Mm -hmm. And it's a good idea, I think. It's a very good idea. You know, um, when, uh, when you asked the earlier question about stocks for the long run, um, one of the examples I like to give, which is a, maybe a, a... Zvi likes to prove this point using option theory. I like to prove the point using history, because I think that's more accessible for most people. Um, in uh, 1904, a German industrialist named Paul Wolfscale, who was an amateur mathematician, established what became known as the Wolfscale Prize, which would go to the first mathematician who could solve Fermat's last theorem. And some people in the room are familiar with it. It's, it was the biggest unsolved puzzle in, in mathematics. And um, the money, the, he set the prize up uh, with an initial endowment of 100,000 German marks, which was an enormous sum of money at the time, because he really wanted to flush out the world's best mathematicians to solve this puzzle. And um, that was 1904. And finally, in, I believe, 2001, Fermat's last theorem was solved by a mathematician named Andrew Wiles, who is not at BU. Um, and, He's a prince, um, isn't he? That's correct. Yeah. And, uh, but we have an off ramp. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you do. Uh, and the, here's the astounding thing. That money was invested entirely in equities. It was invested entirely in German equities. Perhaps not the best asset allocation choice, but a very good one in 1904, when the German stock market was one of the most robust in the world. When Andrew Wiles received the prize, I believe he got about $50,000 U.S. after over 90 years of continuous investment. That wasn't fees, was it? No, it was not <laughs> fees. It was, it was what people who believe in stocks for the long run would like to call capital yeah. appreciation. That's a dramatic example. Yeah, and it shows the devastating effect mm -hmm. that time can have on an equity portfolio when the environment is not favorable. 
and it may not be. We seldom hear stories like that, but we do hear about the grandmother who bought 10 Pepsi shares in 1910, and her grandchildren inherited $40 million and that sort of thing. Right. It's interesting that there are stories on the other side as well. Now, that doesn't mean that any of us, but I know Jason, is probably true for Jason, certainly me, that doesn't mean I'm bearish on the stock market. It just means, because I'm not, it just means I'm cognizant of the risk. It's volatility, Correct. sure. Please, uh, no, don't ask until we get a microphone. Thank you to a large extent what you're talking about depends on, again, is a person trying to more preserve what they're saving and its buying power, or they're trying to grow with what they're earning. I mean, if you look at a difference, if you have somebody who's 35 over 30 years, the difference between getting 8 or 9% and getting, when you talk about tips, especially in a mutual fund, I mean, you have a whole other layer of fees, which really cuts into the returns. You're not getting what you With pay. tips? Yeah. No, you can buy them directly from the U.S. Not Treasury. In a, not, in a 401k. not in a 401k. Right, but that's what we're talking about. Aren't we talking about, mm. no? Are, well, unfortunately, you, can't, we, yeah. unfortunately you can't buy them at all in most 401k no, plans. Well, they, no, they have tips. I mean, I don't know if, if it's the, offered, but yeah. Those are tips mutual funds. Right, but in a Defeats the point plan. of having tips. But if you're talking about target date investing, are you talking about 401k plans generally or no? Well, I mean, the specific topic that we were addressing was saving towards retirement right. for an adequate retirement, which which means you have a target date, roughly speaking, in mind. Right, but so, again, if, if a person doesn't, it, it has a large amount of money, they're saving each year and they're more concerned with preserving the, the buying power of, of that savings over time, fine, do tips. But for a lot of people who maybe are not in that category, they need to grow their savings. I don't, I don't see. Well, let me ask. Advocate that, and the other thing is, I think, in terms of equities, you know, you have to look at the broad market, whether you're in what classification, are you doing small caps, are you doing large caps, are you doing some foreign or emerging markets, are you mixing those all up? Not to mention that certainly in defined contribution plans, your dollar cost averaging, if the market takes a dip, you have the ability, you're buying more at lower prices over time. So, you know, for somebody who's 35 years old, I just don't see how you could advocate doing tips. Well, let, let me uh, put it this way. If you say to me, well, but there are people who aren't saving as, so much, they need to earn more. Does the fact that they need to earn more make equities any less risky? Doesn't seem to me it does. Does it make them, it, in other words, it psychologically it makes make them more susceptible to investing in equities because they're more desperate for a, the future income. But those are the last people who should be taking more risk. But Zvi, didn't you say earlier that uh, your concern about the predictability of the investment applies more towards people approaching retirement than it does to... Absolutely, yeah. So, so let's, let's agree, let's agree that the strongest case for having a guaranteed floor, okay, where people really can't afford to lose value, is as they're approaching retirement. The last 10 years? Yeah. Now, none of the target date funds do anything that I'm aware of okay, to guarantee any level of wealth or income as you reach retirement. All they do is change the mix of mutual funds so that there's less in equity, more in bond funds. And even the TIPS funds that are being offered don't do what I'm proposing because they are in a mutual fund form. So they have volatility. There's, you, they have no guaranteed value at a maturity date. Let me take it the other way. Uh, the best case for being heavily into equities Let's just do it on our fingers. If you accept the risk, so you're not particularly risk averse, if you're young with a lot of human capital, which is relatively safe and relatively flexible. By flexible, I mean if you had to uh, work longer to make up for investment losses, you could do it. If you wanted to retire early, you could do it. Um, so it's not a nine to five kind of job. It's a job where you can have extra earning opportunities. Um, and, uh, you know, 
at that point, uh, the uh, the target life cycle funds, they usually start off about 88%. I just saw a paper from Jim Perturba across all the funds he'd surveyed, 88% if you're age 30. And then does a funny thing. It goes down to about 50%, but right at 65, between 60 and 65%, the average goes from 50% to 30%. No, that's and changing now. It's changing now. Well, this is as of 2005. They're, they're pushing that up. Because what they want to do was kind of signal to people that it's time to be safe now in that last five-year gap. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't doing anything that's Visa advocating in terms of guaranteeing anything. All they were doing was kind of radically changing the mix of equities downward. Mm -hmm. um, but for example, people make a mistake all the time. Uh, Robert Posen, made, I, I just made this mistake. He said, look, people are living longer. And because of longevity risk, that means that even as you approach 60, 65, you have, ought to have more equities. That makes no sense to me. They're just as risky, as V said, and riskier for somebody who doesn't have these. Especially when you are withdrawing money in retirement. Because then the sequence of, then you have the opposite of dollar cost averaging. Then the sequence of returns makes a huge difference. If you have bad returns in those first few years, you could exhaust your entire fund. Well, I think, I think Bob Posen's point is that if 60 is the new 40, in terms of our life expectancy, and if you scholars would say a 35-year-old could take more risk, yeah. then he would say a contemporary 65-year-old could take more risk because he's going to be productive until he's 85. Yeah. Yeah. The, the solution yeah. is just you've got to save more at the beginning. I That's think, the solution. I think um, I, yeah. for example, I'd much rather have someone who's saving $1,000 a month um, and uh, getting a 7% return, chasing a 9% return in the stock market, let's say, with the risk. I'd much rather have, you know, you can do the calculation. It goes, you know, it accumulates a little bit faster. Uh, because compound interest isn't that great. I'd have, rather have them save $2,000 a month. I personally, I personally am 75% in equities. Oh, well, but I, I, have, I have a financial advisor oh, who, but, I don't worry about it though. But he's only 32, which uh, is yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I'm a pretty risk-loving, flexible kind of guy. One size uh, does not fit all. Right. Right, but uh, you're advocating for other people. That they, I mean, default you're options. I'm, yeah, I'm advocating that the default option should be uh, a bit more conservative and should have much higher savings rates. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a, I'm sorry. There's, no, we have a question with a microphone behind you. Yeah. We're hiring three and firing two, where I have 75% invested in the market. It's a bit high, but I've not been sleeping under the bed with the stuffed animals recently <laughs> because I do trust him over three years. However, when you talk about tips, I wouldn't touch... Uh, uh, an inflation invested return because even with compounding whether my age or even if I was younger even with compounding you're still better off as all the charts say with small caps and a diversification no one as I've heard so far perhaps I've had too much wine has talked about diversification so if you diversify and maybe even have some tips some small some mid some large that's the best of all possibilities, probably at any age. Sure, when you're younger, you have the earning ability, and that's the human capital, that's your biggest investment. As you get older, it's real estate and things in the market. So it changes. But I don't understand why you've been saying um, to have tips. That's a very low return, especially for someone that's young, where they can make the money again and have uh, enough of it in the market with an investment counselor, perhaps, or even on their own with mutual funds. I want to. I want to make sure. I have eight or ten percent of my portfolio in tips. So when I, you know, if you hear one that's side, that's still of a it, small amount. It's a small amount, but it's a insurance kind of amount. Okay. okay. I want to. I want to start answering Fritz V. I'm going to. I'm going <laughs> <laughs> to help Excellent. him out. I need let's, all the help I can get. Let's let's say let's say you believe the propaganda and you conclude that the expected return on equities is 10% a year for, from now through infinity, um, you immediately have to subtract 3% uh, for inflation. You now have 7. Um, if you invest through mutual funds, you have to subtract at least one percentage point for management fees. Your third financial advisor I assume charges you somewhere between one and two percent a year. One percent, but if you have mutual funds, one percent, financial advisors, one percent, either or. Either you're saying he invests directly in specific equity, or 
Ah, okay. Is, but your, your point is not, you're not seven, you're probably closer to six. Yeah, okay, you're, yeah. Looking at, you're looking at six. You're looking at, wait just a second. You're looking at six, an expectation of six, assuming that the future is identical to the past, which is a huge assumption. The six is an enormously risky number. The three to four that you get with tips is guaranteed. Now I'm going to use my... Now it's your turn. Uh, let, me, let me put it in a different way. Let's take your advisor. Suppose you were go, to go to your advisor and say, look, you're advising me to put all this money into equities, diversified, fully diversified. Okay, small cap, large cap, cap cap, international, fully diversified. Okay? Now you say to him, look, since you're so confident that this is going to outperform tips, why don't you just throw in for free a guarantee that says, I'm going to earn at least what I would have earned if I had invested in tips. Isn't that a sensible thing? No. Why not? <laughs> it's not sensible because no one gives you that type of guarantee. Why not? The reason they don't is because it's risky. Look, suppose you go to a, an auto sales. It's like now. having your surgery, though. You're not in pain now. You took that risk. It that's, was high reward. That's fine. The doctor didn't tell me I didn't have to worry about the risk. Quite the opposite. He made it clear, and he had me sign 14 different forms. <laughs> that's the point. I'm not saying you shouldn't invest in equities. I'm saying you should be fully aware of just how much risk you're taking. In your portfolio, what percentage are you invested in tips? I'm not going to answer the question for the following <laughs> reason. No, uh, basically, you know, I, I may not look it, but I'm 93 years old. <laughs> so I'm 100% in tips. No, the point is this. Everything depends on your risk tolerance, right? But there are some objective things. So you're making the statement, or maybe you're not, but what I hear you saying is, my heavens, with a diversified portfolio of equities, surely I can outperform tips. Over time. Over time. What period of time? 25 years. OK. So if that's true, Shouldn't you be able to get very cheap insurance guaranteeing it? That's just not the way it works. No, but he's, well, I think I, he's, I'm I think, saying I think as a logical proposition, you can actually buy that insurance. You know what it would cost? A lot of money. And the reason it would cost a lot of money is because stocks are very risky. The longer the time period you're investing, the riskier they are. If I said to you, I've got an incredible automobile downstairs, never needs oil, it's going to outperform gas mileage 10 times anything else, okay, and it'll cost you, you know, I know you can't afford that much, so for $100,000, I'll let you have this car. Okay? No guarantee. Okay, but trust me. Would you buy that car without a guarantee? I don't think so. So if your broker says to you, equities, a diversified portfolio of equities, for sure is going to outperform tips, that you're going to do without a guarantee? He never said that. I wouldn't do that. Yeah. It's a risk. I understand that. But I've made more over time being invested in equities you know than what? tips. My house has never burned down, and I've been living in it for 20 years. I still buy insurance. You know, I, just I think before his surgery, he was very mild-mannered. Right. Right. Um, this is but true. I used to smile, <laughs> never say anything. One other but thing I think, about, I think, about the, I think uh, Professor Bodhi's point is that uh, the volatility is real. 
on the 25th year, if God forbid that was the year you needed it at all, that may be a really bad year to get it, even though over time it's going to outperform treasuries. So because all the, all the mathematicians in the world understand this, he's saying, therefore, you cannot buy cheap insurance because everybody appreciates the fact that it's just too volatile, although you may end up being absolutely right. In your 25th year, if you go after it all, it may be hugely accumulated in that particular year. I, I, I'm been talking to Professor Bode, and I'm not his student, although I wish I were. I took the point away that people who have money, significant money, can afford to do things that the Joe Lunch Bucket, if you'll excuse the expression, amount, or she makes a certain amount, and they need to retire because they're going to be fired anyway by the 65, because that's the requirement. And they don't have a lot. And for them, it's really risky, because they might take your point or your advisor's point and get into a diversified international portfolio of equities. But when they, when they need to retire, they need to retire. They need to eat. They need to pay the rent. And at that point, that may not, it may not be a very good year. So I think the point these three scholars are making is particularly valid for sort of the average person. Because the wealthy person may be more or less wealthy, but they're wealthy either way, even though they're taking some risk. The average person is going to be wiped out if he does the wrong uh, retirement investing early on. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Fair to say. Yeah. One Go. other point I was going to say in the question. Um, human nature, behavioral economics and so forth, uh, we've had a great stock market era here. I think people don't realize exactly, if you haven't lived through my father's age and depressions and everything, don't realize exactly how extraordinary it is. I make the same mistake. I like JetBlue. I've flown from JetBlue to San Francisco, to Long Beach, to Tampa, Christmas, spring, every time. So I figure I'll fly JetBlue today, even though I know in the news they're having all sorts of difficulties and so forth. So I know that I've made money in the past in stock market investments. I tell myself, I know it's risky, but it's always worked out pretty well. So why shouldn't it work this time? And I give myself a margin of error, and I, ha I have some insurance here, and I, I, I have a 2.30 flight, and I figure out how can I not get here by 6 o'clock or 5.30? Well, mm. it's risky uh, traveling the short distance from Boston to New York yeah. uh, this, and worrying about yeah. This gentleman had his hand else. up for some time. Wait, wait for the microphone, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, he's had uh, his okay. hand up for a long okay. time, too. Oh, okay. I'll get, get it back. After I'm done, I'll pass it over to you. Okay. So We have until breakfast, so just relax. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's fine. Uh, maybe lunch. Uh, anyway, what happens now? You reach your target. You've reached your 65. Do you do it? Do you t do it again? Do you put it in another target one now that you're getting ready to collect your IRA and you have to start taking it out? Where do you go from there? I'm so happy you asked that question. <laughs> no, really, because this is one of the biggest needs is fairly priced life annuities that have inflation protection. In other words, again, if we're concerned about Joe Lunch Bucket or even Svi Lunch Bucket, there is some minimum level of spending that I want to protect in retirement. So what I would like to do is buy highly rated insurance company annuities that guarantee, guarantee to supplement Social Security. That last is my whole life, fully protected against inflation. Those now exist. Not only do they exist, but we are now offering them to all BU employees on a competitive platform. Is there anything income. left uh, for the heirs, or does it all disappear? At, at it the disappears. End? Anything That's, you annuitize yeah. doesn't last for the heirs. So my approach to this is to say, the first thing I owe my children is that I don't become dependent on them. I want to make sure that I have enough income for the rest of my life that at least they don't have to be burdened by me. If there's something left over, if Lou gives me a big raise, great. You know, there'll be something left over. But primarily, I want to make sure that I don't become dependent on them. And by the way, what I'm saying reflects the attitude of a lot of boomers. You know, the, there have been endless surveys of the attitudes of the boomer generation. One of the things we didn't mention was many boomers don't really plan to retire, at least not fully. And so 
the so-called savings crisis that we hear about so much may be overblown, okay? Because if you're not going to retire, you don't need to be saving that much as long as you have good health insurance in your old age. So I think we should be thinking a lot more about new forms of insurance and a lot for the, the boomers and a lot less about mutual funds and mutual fund products. That's where I'm coming from on this. We're going to go back to the... We usurped his question. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I have a couple questions. Uh, I happen to be a certified financial planner and a financial advisor, so I have a lot of frontline experience. Um, a question for, uh, for Professor Bodie, first of all, or, or sort of a comment and a question. It seems to me that your attitude towards target date investing and just the 401k marketplace and retirement planning is one that's um, sort of uh, static. You're not considering individual issues. You're not considering asset allocation for that individual. You're not considering um, the, um, the worth of active planning throughout the process. No, Rather, that's not true. it's a static thing in your mind. Do you want to? No, that's that, that's not true. It's <clears throat> from the consumer point of view, right? The end user. I don't think that the consumer wants to be actively involved in asset allocation. Just like I don't want to be actively involved in the upkeep of my computer or my automobile or anything like that. So I'm going to, first of all, try and buy something that needs a minimum of that type of attention. And I'm going to go to experts, expert financial planners. By the way, I should say here that I just came back a couple of weeks ago from the National Convention of NAPFA, which you probably know is the National Association of Personal Financial Advisors. And I did a four-hour workshop, which is a little bit longer than I think we have on this subject with a group of a hundred financial planners all of whom thought that I was right on because what I was saying to them was fundamental element in retirement planning has to be a layer of guaranteed income and that's what all of them tell their clients now of course on top of that you know, whatever is going to be put at risk, there are many ways to do it. And many financial advisors are also investment advisors, and they get involved in that. But many financial planners are not investment advisors. They just subcontract that out to mutual funds. But the, that particular group of financial planners was extremely receptive to this idea. But don't you think that the target date investments are a result of people not wanting to pay for high-end financial planning, don't want to spend the time actually figuring out what it is they're going to need to live annually, and then go in that direction, which is really the, the, the right way to do it. The target date funds are for the people who can't afford financial planners. One big problem, let me give you an example of where it's a big improvement over what was done with that. Many Joe Lunch Buckets, who have these plans, are investing entirely in their own company stock. We're going to call them average Americans. Average yeah. Americans. Yeah. Joanne. Well, not after Ed Rock. <laughs> yes, right, they are. Whatever. It made very little difference. So, are you saying that the whole 401k environment is flawed? Absolutely. Look. 401k plans were never, ever intended to be pension plans. They were add-on savings plans for companies that already had traditional defined benefit plans. And it was a way to allow people in a tax-sheltered environment to supplement their insured pension plan with an investment in other things. And through a variety, a very complex set of issues, among them the near bankruptcy of the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation and the fact that traditional pensions have become much more expensive because we finally succeeded in bringing inflation down, right? So it's made traditional pension plans too expensive for many companies. They are terminating them 
and they are substituting what was available. But what was available was not for that purpose. And essentially what I'm saying is we have to go back to the drawing board. We need something that's much more like defined benefit plans that basically offer insurance to people that they'll have a basic standard of living in retirement. And sure, there should be the potential for participating in the upside of the market. But fundamentally, what people want is insurance. They don't want to become investors. They Let me still need to have an equity exposure, is what you're saying. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. Uh, going back to the example of all the money being invested in German mm -hmm. equities, 1904, if you invest in any one company, it's easy to understand the volatility. It mm -hmm. may have its big problems or great successes. If you invest in an industry, you may have a little insulation, but not much, because the industry has its ups and downs. If you invest in the country, mm -hmm. you have a little more insulation, because there are many industries. If you have a portfolio made up of funds, of equities, of small, mid, and large cap stocks, across all industries, across all countries, a, you'd have obviously mathematically less volatility, although mm -hmm. there'd still be some. Right. But the other thing there'd is, there'd still be a lot. But you, you would think that scholars like yourselves could compute whether or not there's a business called insurance on that, what I just described. I'm sure there is. And if there is, you can insure a return slightly better than inflation, or so, some return, and make money on the difference if you believe in your own math. Correct. But nobody, of course, what you will discover is that even doing that, and believe me, I've gone through these calculations, even doing that is very expensive. And the reason it's so expensive is that equity volatility, no matter how much you diversify it across countries, across industries, is still substantial. And the reason that's so is that equities are the residual. That's where all the risk of the capitalist economy resides. Mm -hmm. okay? That's the residual. So if you and I have secure labor contracts with our corporations, that risk that we transferred to the corporation went somewhere. It went to the shareholders. And that's true across the globe. Equity is the riskiest thing. Professor Bodie. And it doesn't get safer no matter how much you diversify. Uh, I'm sorry to hey, interrupt. Hey, can you I, I have someone to else ask speak? you a question. Can you well, I'll, else I'll speak? relinquish, no, I'll relinquish it one second. Equities are riskier than, than um, fixed income. But behind the equity platform, you have management that is able to be proactive and responsive to changing environment. You don't have that with, in theory, with fixed income. So doesn't that take some of the equity risk away? No. It's in, it, fact, it's in the base, is what he's saying. Yeah. Okay. Please. Uh, Zvi and uh, Jason, this is more directed towards the two of you. Uh, first, I want you to know I agree completely with what both of you have been saying. And uh, history has shown us over and over oh, again that know. you're right worldwide. So I don't even understand why there's still a debate at this point. I think the wealth management industry is trying to take the population for a ride. That's my opinion. But uh, I have a, uh, another issue I wanted to ask you about and ask for your interpretation. I'm concerned that the Fed has been uh, misstating the inflation rate for the last several years by probably about two or three percent a year. Uh, and obviously that factors into returns on tips, equities, bonds, everything available to us. And it's going to, infect, it's going to affect everybody down the road at some point in the future. I want to know where your, um, your uh, uh, strategy for investing in tips fits into the scheme of this. If, in fact, the Fed is understating inflation what, by 2 or 3 what's, percent what's a your year. What's your evidence that they're under understating it? Uh, well, I go out routinely and do surveys of, uh, of what, um, what various things cost me and what they cost other people around the country. And I find that for the last... Uh, probably uh, four to five years, uh, the rates are actually a couple of percentage points higher than what's being fed to us. There may be a New uh, York CPI and there may be a U.S. CPI. Uh, well, there are. Well, there are, not, geogra there not, are different geographies. Yeah, yeah, but it, but, but it's, not a even, it's not even a ge uh, geographical thing. I mean, I mean the, the Fed routinely uh, uh, changes um, the weighting of certain 
things that go into the calculations. Uh, let, let, let me respond to that, and then I'll let my colleagues. First of all, just a minor technical correction. It's not the Fed who computes the rate of consumer price inflation. It's the Bureau of Labor Statistics. But that's neither here nor there. They do the best job they can as professional statisticians. But there's a fundamental problem here, which is you have to decide what a representative household consumes and price that. And the representative household may not represent your basket of goods. So in finance, we say if you're, if you're being compensated for one rate of inflation, but in fact, what you care about is something that's somewhat different from that, you face basis risk. That's the technical term. It's a real risk, okay? So if that index doesn't represent you, it's not really all that great at protecting you. That could be solved in principle by having tips that are indexed to different indices. So one, for example, proposal that I think has a lot of sense to it would be to have a price index for the elderly, right? Part of the pipe, because their basket of consumables is systematically different from people who are younger. And if you want to use this for retirement income, shouldn't you have an index that's more appropriate for them? Sure. You know, as a finance professor, looking at the modern world of finance, I say, my God, there are so many exotic financial instruments out there that are traded. How about inventing some that are relevant to people's standard of living? You got all these exotic options and derivatives that are being traded, right, and invented purely for speculative reasons. And it's a big business. Why don't we direct, channel a little of that energy to the things peop, most of us really care about? Bill, you were going to respond to the... No, actually, I'll, 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 we have the last word on that one. Okay. <laughs> Jason, yeah. did you have something to say on I'm that? I'm good. You're good. Okay. No, I, I thought that was a good response. I actually like that idea. But, but do, you, do you honestly feel that the uh, inflation rate is properly stated as it's been the past few years? You know, there is some, what do you think? You think it's understated or overstated? Uh, it's understated. Uh, you think it's understated? Uh, yeah, I think well, it you is know, understated. You know, the, the last time this was studied by a high-level panel of academic economists, this was in the Bush administration, the first Bush, they recommended, they came to the conclusion that the Bureau of Labor Statistics systematically un overstates inflation by at least a percentage point. Well, that, so that, there you go. Yeah, but that would fit in, that would fit in uh, very nicely with the uh, concerns that we have over the uh, deficits. Uh, one way to conserve money and keep interest rates lower is to understate but, inflation. But the economists on that panel were, yeah, in my judgment, impartial. They were scholars, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm but, sure it would be true no, today, they, too. There, there are reasons. There's always an argument that the basket they use is not representative of large segments of the population. And so for them, they're not experiencing the same inflation. People in their 60s are not buying houses, and there's a lot of them, baby boomers. Well, there are lots, there are lots of arguable decisions that are made in constructing an index like that. It's not at all clear that it leads to a downward bias. In fact, the prevailing opinion, if you were to ask the experts about this in the academic community, they probably say that it overstates inflation for two major reasons. One is there are quality improvements. So when the car that you buy today is actually a better car than the so-called comparable car before. Part of the increase in price is actually paying for something better. You don't want to treat it as inflation. But we do treat it as inflation. So that would give you an upward bias. The other thing is the basket is fixed. But we know that when relative prices change, consumers will shift out of those things that are more expensive into those that are less expensive. I do this every time I go grocery shopping, okay? I bear 
I buy plums if they're cheaper than peaches, and so forth. But if you're measuring inflation as a fixed number of peaches and a fixed number of plums, you're actually going to overstate the inflation that I'm experiencing. So those are two very strong reasons to believe that measured inflation is actually an overestimate. We have eight minutes before breakfast. Please. Quick question. Um, given all of the arguments and counter arguments here, what are your thoughts on the potential incorporation of vehicles like structured notes into the 401k marketplace that provide equity-like exposure with the downside insurance premiums that, that, that you spoke Yeah, I think, I think that's the future of investing at the consumer level. I think what people can understand is not abstract discussions about probabilities of success, probabilities of failure, but rather tell me what amount you're guaranteeing and what is at risk. If I'm willing to reduce the amount of guarantee, I get more upside participation. That's the fundamental feature of the kinds of structured products that I think you have in mind, like equity participation notes and so forth. So I'm betting that that will be the future. In other words, mutual funds won't go out of style. It's just they're going to become intermediate products for people who are more sophisticated users. And for the average consumer who doesn't want to do their own asset allocation or doesn't want to be dependent on a manager to do that for them, structured products are going to be the product. I agree. And I'm almost shocked that they haven't come into the 401k marketplace as of now, especially given the fact that they're reasonably priced. They provide downside market protection. It's you know. around the corner. It is very, very big in Europe. Yeah, I agree. Thanks. Uh, we can take two more questions. Is there, did someone have a hand up? Please. All right. Um, Blackstone private equity firm will be making its initial public offering at the end of the month. Uh, do you see this as a growing trend of private equity firms becoming, quote unquote, public equity firms? Well, there are two counter trends, right? Because there are a lot of public companies that are going private. So there's a kind of this and that going on. No, I don't see that as a big trend. Jason? Um, I think there's, a, there's sort of a natural ceiling on that trend because the clients of these firms tend to be very powerful. They're the largest pension funds in the country and in the world. And um, the amount of fee disclosure and personal income disclosure that goes along with an IPO uh, is not going to be particularly pop very popular with those clients. Um, you know, now that everyone in America knows that Steve Schwartzman, you know, is going to be worth eight billion dollars. Uh, uh, not all the other private equity guys are going to be rushing to market. They don't really want their, mm -hmm. everyone staring into their underwear all the time. So. Bill? Ditto. Ditto. That's a good that. point. Yeah. yeah. So based on those responses, why shouldn't I be shorting it the second I can get my hands on it? Why short it? We're not, we're not saying that it's not going to sell at a, at a, it may go to a big premium after it goes public. But the question is, will other private equity firms follow that trend and go public. And I, I agree with Jason. I couldn't have said it any better. Well, I, I guess I would add one minor point, which is um, there's a prevailing belief, which frankly reminds me of the stocks for the long run belief, that um, private e equity investors are sort of a superior life form who um, know how to double the return on anything they invest in. And the, the, there's a good reason to be skeptical about that. I'm not telling you you should run out and short it. But um, it's interesting to think about the fact that the last noteworthy investment Blackstone made was in um, uh, office equity properties, which was Sam Zell's real estate firm. Sam Zell is probably the shrewdest real estate investor in history. If he's selling, I'm not interested in buying. Um, <laughs> Sam, you know, could wear hobnail boots and, and step on a dime and tell you whether it was heads or tails. And 
<laughs> if Blackstone is buying from him, I don't want to be buying from Blackstone. Do you think China's $3 billion investment is noteworthy at all? Yeah, I think it's, you know, I think for all the obvious reasons that have been discussed in the newspapers, I mean, I think the Chinese government is looking for other ways to recycle all the dollars it's getting from us. And um, also, Blackstone wants to get, you know, a, a, its toe in the door in China. And, uh, but I, I don't, you know, think back to 20 years ago. I was just going to say. When that. these buildings across the street were bought by the Japanese. And the cut. Right, and the cover, the cover of Newsweek and Time uh, said Japan was taking over America. Pebble Beach. You know, they bought Pebble Beach for $400 million and then they went bankrupt. Right. Uh, basically, everything they touched went bad. You know, who's to say the Chinese will make the same mistake, but I'm, I'm in no hurry to get alarmed about it. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a question and still take one more. And my question is, there's been lots of press in recent months of pension funds getting into infrastructure, buying bridges and toll yeah, roads. Yeah. Uh, because of the predictable cash flow. Does that give you any more comfort that that money is safer than it used to be when it was in equities? Well, I, I think it makes perfectly good sense for pension funds to be investing in the most illiquid types of investment because they do have predictable needs for cash, unlike mutual funds where you could have a run right. at any time. Mutual funds need liquidity. Pension funds don't need liquidity. So that makes perfectly good sense to me. Uh, now, whether they should be investing in equities or fixed income depends a lot on what their liabilities are. Okay? So I'm, I'm a very strong believer in pension funds matching their assets to their liabilities. Okay. One, one, one final question, please. Hi there. Uh, it's actually a question for Professor Samuelson. How realistic is retirement? Is this a fantasy? I mean, think about it. I mean, it's a good question. When you consider what people have to deal with, average person, you know, Joe McLunch Bucket, in my in my case, realistically, is retirement going to happen in the sense that you know they sell the fantasy, of course, of the the villa, you know, the waspy the waspy golf course life, but I mean, most people think in terms of being in, independent of their children. But how realistic is that? I mean, I'll ask you to include all factors. Yeah. How uh, much people have to spend during the course of their lifetime, the fact that they will make mistakes, the fact that they will have health issues. Is, are, are we being sold something the same way that people sell you the fantasy of you know, being a uh, supermodel if you buy this particular handbag? That's yeah. my question. Thank uh, you. Well, I think we've got a big burden of responsibility, for sure. I mean, given that the defined contribution rather than defined benefit. I've got uh, a small sample of folks I think everyone's different, but small sample folks. I have friends who are fed up with being a uh, internist and has worked very long and hard and made enough money they're going to retire early and can do that. Uh, and this is two income families, obviously. I've got uh, knowledge of Joe Lunchbuckets and so forth who are in seriously, bad, but seriously bad shape. And as far as I can tell, are going to be working until they drop. Until they drop, right? Until the medical bills. Uh, take over and so And forth. then there's your father. Uh, and I've got a dad who's, who's healthy at 92 and is still uh, uh, working ac in a sense, yeah. uh, well, academically and so forth. There's, there's, um, been a lot, there's been a lot written on longevity now because of all the baby boomers right. and so forth. And the fact that retirement, the, the 65 notion that Otto von Bismarck figured out in Germany, you know, 80 years ago, was when you were dead. Yeah. Right. And so after 65, would, you'd be at the extreme end of the curve. There wouldn't be much liability. Now 65 is middle age. And so the question of retirement that she's asking, I think it's an important one because people are seeing themselves as having multiple careers, multiple educations, unfortunately multiple marriages, lots of multiple things where it used to be just a circle. You started, got educated, got married, worked and died, and now there's this going in and out. And if that happens into the 70s and 80s, uh, that will, that the, the, economy is many, the, the economy is absorbing us, which is quite remarkable. Right, right. But I didn't really answer your question, so I'm more optimistic in the sense that if you keep things simple in terms of savings and investment behavior, 
uh, and get people. I think it's a blip that the savings behavior has been so deficient over the last 25 mm -hmm. years. I think you, you know, if you went 20 years from now, given longevity and so forth, I think savings would be a lot different in the U.S. I hope they are. I think the default would be everyone's doing tax sheltered savings. Everyone's doing it at the rate of 10 or 15 percent a year. Uh, it's going to change how much you can spend now versus later, but I think the trade off is very real. And I think people are going to have very simple investment plans. So people who can afford financial planners will have financial planners. People, the average person, will have a well-diversified portfolio with tips mm -hmm. as a portion, uh, with international equity as a portion. And we won't have to all figure it out. It, occurred um, to it me makes me very tired. My, I'm a law, my wife's a tax lawyer, and I'm an economist. I can't even figure out uh, what <laughs> we should be doing, so I've offloaded it. Right. Uh, completely. To well, somebody else who can't figure it yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> well, they, they can figure but it charges out. For it. <laughs> yeah. it, it occurred to me this past week in, in another context that uh, about 25 years ago, the participation rate in this country was about 60 percent. Of all the adults, 60 percent claimed to be in the workforce. And, when it, and it had been that for quite a long time. And the economists, as I recall back then, consensed that 6 percent unemployment was full employment because of churning from job to job. And now you dial forward to where we are now with all that we have to complain about. We've got plenty to complain about. We have 66% participation rate, which includes now some older people. We have 12 million, maybe 15 million undocumented workers who are working. We have globalization, which has taken jobs away from this country. We have technology, which has taken more jobs away than globalization. If you told a, a, an economist that 25 years ago, that's going to be the scenario. It'd be Armageddon. And in fact, we have a 4.5% unemployment rate, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. absolutely incredible yeah. to me. Yeah, that's a wonderful point, Lou. You know, I think that, that it's very easy to confuse um, being um, pessimistic with being wise. And I think um, cynics are wise. I think pessimists tend to be foolish. Um, and it's not that America is founded on optimism and I'm an American, so therefore I'm optimistic. It's because uh, pessimism isn't very useful. And the human species is evolving continuously. We're evolving very rapidly even now. It's important to realize financial markets, as we recognize them, are a few centuries old. Money is a couple of thousand years old. A human lifespan longer than an average of 35 years is only a few hundred years old. Our minds and brains and bodies weren't really designed to think about something 30 to 40 years from now. But we're learning. And as Bill pointed out, the system is getting better. The kinds of reforms that were introduced last year to impose mandatory default choices in 401ks are going to make a big difference in how much money people save. And habits will form. People will do better. And the point I would make in just in response to the rather heated arguments we had between the floor and the stage is my point about tips or equities is very simple. Investing is not about certainties. It's about probabilities. And the fallacy that people have concluded about equities is that the equities are guaranteed to give you a superior return. They are not. I have most of my money in stocks because I think the probabilities suggest that's not a bad idea. I would never put all my money in stocks, no matter how diversified I can get, because there is no guarantee. And I also don't think age is the only factor either because how much risk you should take is the most complicated decision you could make, and it's not purely a function of where your hairline is on your head. Thank you. That's a good summary. I, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Several of you had said that you'd love to come to more of these and make certain that our folks have your business cards so we can keep you on the mailing list, because we do two or three or four of these in New York every year. Um, and we get some really good professors to come to some. <laughs> They're my friends. In any event, uh, thank you all very much for coming. I did want to express, on behalf of the school, a tangible appreciation to my two colleagues and to Jason for being with us. And uh, you're all welcome to stay for some more reception and to ask more private questions, if you like. But thank you very much. And thank you, Zvi and Jason and Bill, very much. Yeah. Thank you. I forgot to remind you. But you remember. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate it.